First day of class, I usually launch into an opening lecture on hierarchies in biology, as well as more philosophical angles. But this semester, things are a bit different. We aren't meeting in person, and so there's not the same awkwardness of sitting in a room with 30 strangers, wondering what the class is going to be like. My usual approach of jumping right into the deep end of the pool is a good way of fast-forwarding past that uncertainty period. We don't really need that here, and so I suppose I could start by going over the syllabus. But I'm not going to do that. We'll have a long, live, also recorded, class meeting in lab the first week, where there will be plenty of time for our syllabus discussion. So the question I had in coming up with this recorded version of lecture one is whether or not I should do something different in the first lecture for this remote version of Bio 202. One of the constraints of a typical first day lecture is that I have to anticipate that students will not have done any pre-reading. Not so here. I could have asked you to read chapter one before opening this video. Note, I haven't. But this would lead you to expect me to actually follow the text reading somewhat in my lecture. And that would also be not representative of what you should expect from my lecture instruction in Bio 202, whether live or recorded. While some of the themes presented in Chapter 1 of the text overlap with what we'll talk about here, for this first video, the text really serves better as a post-lecture resource, something that you can refer to for another view of the things we talk about in the lecture. You can also compare what's in Chapter 1 with what I present in this video, and this will give you a fairly representative picture of how much overlap there will be between a typical Bio 202 lecture and the textbook readings. At the end of this lecture, I'll give you some recommendations on how students can most productively prepare for future lectures. I'm going with my regular first day lecture. Usually, it takes a full 75 minutes of class time, but I expect the video version will be considerably shorter than that. The class syllabus will be on the agenda for our first lab meeting. For now, you should get ready to take notes on content that will be fair game for the first exam. Note taking is mandatory for this class. One of the things we'll do this semester will be to meet in small groups during lab meetings for notes checks. You'll hear more about this in lab. But the content that I'll expect to see in your notes begins with this video, starting now. So let me begin by introducing the concept of the nested hierarchy, which is really not a new concept to any of you. Maybe it's a new term to you, but you've been using nested hierarchies for much of your life in a variety of contexts. The standard example that fits well when I'm talking to a group of college students is the much-loved essay outline. If I were to assign you to read a scientific paper and then to write an essay on, say, how the extinction of dinosaurs affected mammal evolution. You'd read the paper a couple of times, at least a couple of times, and then you'd put together a list of things you want to incorporate into your paper. Maybe you'd meet up with another student or group of students to share your ideas, and in doing so, you might get a few more things you want to put in your essay, right? Then, before you actually start writing your paper, you'll create an outline to organize your thoughts so that each of your points contributes to a cohesive argument and your paper succeeds in convincing the reader, usually me, that you have met the required level of mastery of the concepts needed to be writing this paper. Your ability to organize the points into cohesive and compelling arguments is an important skill. If you were to skip the outlining and throw together the exact same points randomly, your essay would not be convincing at all and would probably suffer grade-wise. So what does your outline look like? Well, most of us are taught to start with a Roman numeral 1 for the first section of your paper, and then within Roman numeral 1, you might have three subsections, A, B, and C. Now, all three of these subsections map conceptually onto the theme that you've made for Roman numeral 1. If they didn't actually pertain to the theme of Roman numeral 1, then you wouldn't want to include them in your outline here, and you wouldn't want to incorporate them into your essay at this point either. They might be truly important points to make, but they belong in a different part of your paper. 
each of the subsections A, B, and C might have its own subdivision into sub subsections, one, two, three, etc., with the same rule that all of the sub subsections of Roman numeral one, subsection A, actually pertain to the theme of that subsection. Otherwise, it doesn't belong in this part of the outline. I know you all know how to do this, and I expect that you will be doing this when you're writing papers for me this semester. I chose this to illustrate because it's a perfect example of a nested hierarchy in which each item, the argument of Roman numeral 1, subsection A, sub, subsection 2, is where it is because it belongs there and not in some other subsection or in the theme of a different Roman numeral. Sub subsections 1, 2, and 3 are nested within subsection A, and subsections A, B, and C are nested within Roman numeral 1, and presumably Roman numeral 1 has other Roman numeral companions, all nested within the whole of your paper. This hierarchy has multiple levels, or ranks. The whole paper is the most inclusive, Roman numeral below that, capital letters below Roman numerals, Arabic numerals below capital letters. Each step downward in rank takes you to a smaller, more specifically defined grouping. Each step upward in rank takes you to a more inclusive, generically defined grouping. This is the structure of a nested hierarchy, and at some level, I have to admit that it's something that I like because it makes me happy and comfortable. I certainly don't want to read papers that are not coherently assembled. I can find nested hierarchies elsewhere in my life, too. I like being able to find things quickly when I'm looking for them, and when my socks, underwear, t-shirts, and Levi's are all thrown randomly into my closet, it takes me longer to get dressed, and that's kind of a drag. I'm guessing that it's not just me. As humans, we appreciate organization because of how it allows us to function better in a complex world. My dog doesn't seem to have any desire to organize her toys and bones and the various items she's stolen from me. It's fine for her to let them be wherever. If she can't find a tennis ball for playtime, she can bring me something else to throw for her. As a dog, she is smart enough to be trained to put specific items in specific locations, but for her, the payoff of being able to find her tennis ball more quickly is not enough to compensate for the effort of fighting entropy and putting all of her things away so that they'd be easy to find. Maybe if she had to get dressed every day in socks, underwear, a t-shirt, and blue jeans, the time she would save would increase the value of being organized. Take a moment to think about the ways in which you keep your own things. Music in your library, personal hygiene products, tools, food items in your pantry. Is your system of organization nested in the sense that there are at least two levels with individual items grouped together and those groups themselves grouped again into higher levels of classification? Pause the video now to give this some thought and write down a couple of examples into your notes. Okay, so by now, I have tried to establish that the nested hierarchy is an easy, familiar concept, and further, that there's at least something within us as humans driving us to put organization into our worlds using constructs like nested hierarchies. It's just something that we're very comfortable with. The next thing I'll ask you to do is a bit more challenging. Does this nested hierarchical structure reflect a real pattern, or is it imposed by a human agent? Another way to think about this is to ask if it would still be valid if there were no human to appreciate its value for making things neater and more organized. Take the essay outline, for example. If you and your study partner were to brainstorm together and agree on a particular list of points to include in your respective papers, such that each of you is going to include all the points on the list and no points other than what's on the list. Does this mean that you and your partner will 
also be coming up with exactly the same outline with Roman numeral 1, A, B, C, etc. being exactly the same? Of course not. Even though you're using the exact same set of arguments, it's extremely unlikely that you'd be putting them together into the same general structure. A third student using that same list would have their own unique nested hierarchy to organize the same set of points. You might have a dozen students using the same list, but each creates their own distinct nested hierarchical structure and uses it to produce an equally compelling essay. The idea that there is a single hierarchy to constitute a single objective reality here that's independent of the human agent is absurd, and I hope that you see this. This is my example of a nested hierarchy that is subjective, not a unique reality, but heavily influenced by the intricacies of human-to-human -human communication. How you craft your paper depends on so many things your prioritization of the material content, who your intended reader is, and how you visualize the paper will be received by this person. And this is not even taking into consideration your mastery of the content and your skill as a writer. The organization of arguments for an essay is clearly a nested hierarchy and, just as clearly, a completely subjective construct and not reflective of a single objective reality in nature. But now, are there nested hierarchies that actually do reflect a singular truth in the natural universe? Something that would not be any different even if there were no humans around to take notice. I offer up two possible examples from biology. Rank-based taxonomy. The first is a pretty obvious one, probably already familiar to some of the students in the class. We use rank-based taxonomy to classify and identify animals, plants, microbes, etc. I would say that in a typical Bio 202 class on the first day, about half of the students are familiar with the ranks of taxonomic classification, maybe even to the point of having remembered them through some handy mnemonic device they learned in high school. Kings play chess on fine game sets is the one that I learned in the eighth grade. The letters K, P, C, O, F, G, S correspond to the taxonomic ranks from highest level to lowest. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Take the domestic dog, Canis familiaris. This is the species name given to all animals descending from the small stock of wolves that were taken into domestication by humans something like 30,000 years ago. It includes Labrador Retrievers, French Bulldogs, Lassa Absos, Cholet Squintles, English Mastiffs, you get the idea, and I'm sure you're familiar with the animal. Canis familiaris is one of a few species that are all clustered within the genus Canis. Besides the dog, there's also the gray wolf, Canis lupus the uh, domestic dog's closest relative. Canis latrans, the coyote. The golden jackal, Canis aureus. Canis simensis, that's the Ethiopian wolf, and a few others. My point here is that many species are grouped together within the same genus. Okay, here I'm going to have to make a point on the side that may sound a bit nitpicky, but actually it's pretty important for anyone who's going to claim to know something about biology. The words genus and species are Latin words that don't follow the English conventions of making plurals from singulars. Both genus and species are singular nouns, but don't catch yourself saying genuses or speciesis, or even worse, presuming that the singular is specie without the S. The plural of genus is genera, and the plural of species is species. Yeah, that's right. It's the same word for both singular and plural. Another example of a word like this is series. So many species are grouped together into the genus Canis. Canis 
together with a whole bunch of other genera are all grouped together into a single family, the Canidae or dog family. An example of another genus in the Canidae is Vulpes, which is the genus containing most foxes. Vulpes vulpes is the red fox, common throughout North America. And also common around here is Vulpes macrotus, the kit fox. Not terribly common on the mainland, but go to visit Catalina Island and you'll see plenty. There are actually a pretty large number of different species, all classified within the genus Vulpes. Vulpes and Canis are two of the ten genera that all classify within the family Canidae. Canidae, together with the Philidae, the cat family, the Ursidae, the bear family, the Phocidae, the seal family, and many others, all classified together within the order Carnivora. From here, we can work our way up the taxonomic hierarchy to higher and higher ranks. Carnivora, together with a whole bunch of other orders, classified together into the class Mammalia. Mammals, together with a whole bunch of other classes, classify into the phylum Chordata. Chordates, together with a whole bunch of other phyla, phyla is the plural of the singular phylum, classify into the kingdom Metazoa or Animalia, if you like. This is another perfect example of a nested hierarchy, right? But is it A, a hierarchy that is reflective of a natural order? Or B, is this just something we humans have imposed onto life's diversity so that it makes sense to us? If humans were to disappear from the planet, and get replaced by another entity intent on classifying all the life forms existing on the Earth, would their classification be similar to ours? If so, then this organization is an objective truth of the natural universe, independent of the human drive to have everything organized. If not, then it's just subjective and not reflecting any natural truth. What do you think? Reflective of reality? or just another product of the OCD-like psychological quirkiness of humans? I hope you see the significance of this question. In science, the objective is to understand truths of the natural universe. In order for taxonomy to be a science, it needs to have that repeatability aspect. That the same result should occur in independent trials, such as if a different observer were to come in and conduct the same study. If it were like the arguments in the students' essays where one subjective truth is potentially as valid as any other, then taxonomy would be meaningless from the standpoint of giving us insight into the actual truth of nature. As a student in Bio 202, you're going to have to get used to the idea of there not always being an answer. Many times this semester, you'll hear me saying that having the answer is less important than asking the right questions. If you're able to ask the question that needs to be asked, then sometimes that's the best demonstration that you're understanding the content properly. Here, it's important for you to recognize the problem that exists if our taxonomic classification was arbitrarily established by some individual somewhere, maybe a museum curator, or maybe a group of experts that put organisms together into groupings based on subjective criteria. If this were the case, then taxonomy would not be a scientific endeavor. However, if a grouping of organisms were validated by some truth about the natural world, then presumably you could get the same result independently of who's assembling the taxonomy. The question at hand here is whether or not there's a reason that validates taxonomy as a description of the natural universe. And if there is, to what extent is rank-based taxonomy repeatable and therefore meeting the expectations of a scientific result? Well, to be fair, taxonomy was originally never intended to be part of our scientific understanding of universal laws. Western civilization's pioneers in taxonomy, from Aristotle to Linnaeus, undertook their comprehensive detailed studies 
with the goal of putting nature into an orderly scheme of organization, and they justified this effort as something that was demanded by religion. By understanding God's creation better, humans inched closer to godliness themselves. And so this was really a form of religious worship. Whatever their motivation was, it was never intended to provide a scientific model for explaining the relative degrees of similarity and differences existing between the varieties of living organisms. Common ancestry. As it turns out, there is a natural reason to explain the similarities between dogs and wolves and coyotes and jackals. A justification from the reality of evolutionary history for why they are legitimately placed together within the same genus. And that reason is common ancestry. At some point in the past, there were no coyotes distinct from cocker spaniels, distinct from Ethiopian wolves. There was just an ancestral animal species from which all animals belonging to the genus Canis descended. The reason why all the species of Canis have a great degree of similarity is that they share a great number of traits inherited unchanged from this relatively recent common ancestor. And the reason why foxes in the genus Vulpes are less similar to dogs in the genus Canis than they are to other Vulpes species is that they share their own common ancestry through the ancestral Vulpes animal species, and that is not a direct ancestor of the dogs in the genus Canis. In other words, there is an objective reality. There's the truth of the evolutionary history of these animals, which species split away from which common ancestors and at what times, which is the goal of taxonomy and validates it as a scientific enterprise. Taking a step further back, Canis and Vulpes are actually pretty similar to each other, much more so than they are to, say, cats or bears. Why? Well, it's because even farther back in time, there was a single ancestral species that gave rise to the lineages of the Canis ancestor, the Vulpes ancestor, as well as all of the other genera in the Canidae. Is this to say that there's no subjective element in taxonomy? No, I'm not saying that. There's actually quite a bit of subjectivity in taxonomy. For example, someone had to decide where to put the boundaries around the genus Canis. This image, taken from Wikipedia, shows the branching pattern or phylogeny for the six members of the genus Canis I mentioned earlier, as well as a couple of closely related dogs that are not classified in the genus Canis. In this diagram, it's called a cladogram, which is a fancy term for evolutionary family tree. There's an animal species right here that is the presumptive common ancestor shared by all the members of the genus Canis shown. It's split into two lineages, one giving rise to the golden jackal and the other lineage eventually splitting into the other kinds of dogs, but all of them are classified within the genus Canis. The dole, Kuan alpinus, does not classify into the genus Canis. It has its own genus, Kuan, because it is not a descendant of the most recent common ancestor shared by all the Canis. But why must this be the common ancestor defining the genus Canis rather than this animal? If we were to go with this animal as the Canis defining ancestor, then doles would need to be identified as Canis alpinus rather than Kuan alpinus. This is what I mean when I say that there's still plenty of subjectivity in taxonomy. It's pretty arbitrary whether the genus Canis is defined by ancestry from this animal or from this one. This would be a kind of subjectivity where you could say there's no right or wrong answer. But this doesn't mean that there are no wrong answers in taxonomy. Let's look a bit further down on the tree. The side striped jackal and the black back jackal are both identified as Canis species, Canis adustus and Canis mesomalus. And yet, they are, according to this phylogeny reconstruction, even more distantly related to my pet dog than the dole or the African wild dog, both of which are not considered part of the genus Canis. If this phylogeny is showing the correct history for the evolution of these dogs, then taxonomy has failed to accurately represent the truth.
Can you see the problem here? In order for Canis adustus, and Canis means a malus, two at the bottom, to be in the same genus as Canis lupus familiaris, which is your familiar pooch, they would have to descend from a common ancestor that is the common ancestor of all dogs in the genus Canis. And in order to do this, you'd have to push back the most recent Canis ancestor to this animal back here, which is more ancient relative to either of the ancestors that we were discussing earlier. But if we do this, then it wouldn't do to have a dole and African wild dog classified into different genera as they currently are. Based on your understanding of taxonomy as a science whose goal is to represent the historical truth of the evolutionary relationships among organisms, can you see that this set of names and this layout of the relationships among the dogs through their family tree are incompatible? Something must be wrong here. Either the tree is wrong, or the dogs have not been correctly classified. If we were to presume that the tree is correct, can you see a way to fix the problem? There are actually two ways to answer this. Pause the video and see if you can work this out. Both solutions require the renaming of two animals in the tree. This is a good place for us to take a breath before moving on with the second half of the lecture, which will be on a separate video.